Um, all right, let's uh, just jump into things here. Um, just to reiterate my bio there, uh, Scott Piper, I'm Dabadoo on Twitter. Those are zeros, not O's. Um, it's hex. That's the cool thing to do in InfoSec. Um, so as you said, I've been in this business for about a decade now. Um, developed all sorts of different tools um, from something similar to Cuckoo Box, something similar to Facebook's OS query or Mandian's um, or response. Um, similar to those, not those products themselves, but uh, I guess competitors. Um, that have been more private. Uh, and then uh, recently I founded a company called Summit Route and we're developing endpoint security product. Um, what that means is that an aspect of that product is, is to do application whitelisting. And so authentic code is one of the technologies that's used in application whitelisting. So I'm just gonna give you guys an overview of what authentic code is, how to use it, um, and some of the details about it. So authentic code. Um, if you right click on a file on Windows and uh, select properties, and for a file that is signed, you'll see that digital signatures tab. Um, so in this example here, this is <coughs> um, Adobe Reader that I looked at, and so you can see that it's signed by Adobe Systems there. Um, Authenticode is a standard that is used, um, it has, or it has a lot of standards um, that it's built on. So for example, uh, PKSC, CS number seven, um, and a bunch of other, uh, I guess, just acronyms. Um, and I'll go through some of those and how they're used later. Um, and then, so it works on, uh, most people are most familiar with it working on executable files, DLLs, sys files. Um, when you install an MSI file, um, those can also be signed, but a lot of other things can be signed as well. So it was originally created for ActiveX files, actually. Um, Java applets can be signed with it. And uh, even PowerShell scripts, uh, which are just text files, can be signed with it. Um, so it's, it can really sign anything. If you want to try and uh, ensure the integrity and uh, be able to verify where a file came from, authentic code is the solution for that. Um, and so, so I should also state uh, just authentic code in general. You can think of it a lot like SSL. Basically, all the same technologies, um, including uh, X509 and PKCS uh, number seven there, all those different things are within um, SSL. Uh, you confirm that a file came from a certain uh, from a place because it's been signed uh, by a certificate that was in it, that was itself signed by a certificate authority, or there's some type of chain of trust that goes up to that certificate authority. So anything that you know about SSL is going to work a lot in the same ways for authentic code. Um, so why would you code sign files? Um, in some cases, you have to. So if you want to. Uh, run a Windows 64-bit driver on uh, Vista or above, you're going to have to sign it. Um, additionally, uh, it's going to avoid some error. So on Internet Explorer, when you try and download a file that has not been code signed and you're one of the first people to download that file, you're going to end up getting this error message there. And so if you're a business and you're trying to provide some software to people, some people might not want to click on that and that might hurt your revenue ultimately. Um, and it just, it's, it's really just a way to establish trust in a lot of different ways. Um, so as a developer, these are the reasons that you want to do it. And I'll discuss later on why an administrator, you would want people to do this. Um, and then additionally, uh, it gives you access to Windows error reports. So if you are um, a software company and uh, your software unfortunately has a bug in it and crashes on systems, and those systems end up sending Windows error reports back to Microsoft.com, um, if you have informed Microsoft that this certificate uh, that that file was signed with belongs to you, you can actually get access to those error reports. And so they're anonymized and everything, but it'll basically help you as a software developer be able to identify where bugs exist in your product out there in the wild. Um, so the other reason, of course, is all the cool kids are doing it. You want to be popular, and all the popular kids are doing it. So uh, here at the top, we have a list of certificate authorities, and below those are some of the different uh, products that have been signed with those certificates, or that there's a chain of trust that goes up to those certificate authorities. Um, so there on the left, you have uh, Google Chrome and Merck, the IRC uh, client. Um, they're all chain up to thought. Uh, Microsoft, of course, has Internet Explorer and Office below it. and um, yeah, there's a variety of other applications. A lot of popular applications are all signed. And one of the important takeaways from this is not only are a lot of popular applications signed, but it, they're signed all across the board with different certificate authorities. Um, so <clears throat> it doesn't really matter which certificate authority you sign your files with. Um, much like SSL, you oftentimes don't know or don't care who the certificate authority is um, that has granted that uh, SSL certificate. Um, same concept applies to authentic code. 
Uh, so a quick history of this, um, Authenticode is actually almost two decades old now, starting in uh, April 1996. Microsoft submitted uh, basically a request for proposals to the W3C, an international standards body. Um, and then uh, shortly after that, it announced that it had Authenticode and it had a partnership with VeriSign, who was one of the original certificate authorities. Um, it worked on Windows NT and Windows 95. Um, this is my understanding. I haven't actually tested on Windows 95 in any way. This is just trying to um, look through old like Usenet postings and stuff to try and understand um, a lot of the history behind things. Um, and so the reason it came out was actually for Internet Explorer version 3.0, um, and that was for ActiveX components. So ActiveX components are basically DLLs that you uh, used to download and run on your computer that various sites would provide. And uh, people realized, like, hey, maybe we should associate some type of trust with these things in some way so people aren't just randomly downloading them from random sites. Um, and so Authenticode was put in place in order to establish that trust to say, yes, this random DLL you're downloading on the Internet and are going to be running on your system actually came from your bank or whoever it happened to be. Um, so when it first came out, there were 20 companies that had, were initially signing their code. Um, of those 20 companies, um, I only recognized two of them, Autodesk and Citrix. It seems all 18 others all have passed away in some manner um, or been bought or whatever it happens to be. Uh, but so, so it originally came out and there were people doing it. So it wasn't, you know, just they came out with this technology and no one happened to be using it. It, it was um, actually used. Uh, so about a year later, um, I believe it was on March 3rd, uh, I had a lot of trouble trying to track this down, but Authenticode 2.0 was released. And the reason they needed to do this was because it added time stamping. Um, and I'll get into why this is necessary, but basically one of their original root certificates was set to expire uh, basically two months after Authenticode 2.0 came out. And without getting Authenticode 2.0 out there and without getting um, time stamping in place, all the files that had been signed previously with a chain of trust up to that um, certificate that was going to expire, uh, it, it, it basically was not, it was voided. It, it didn't understand how to... Um, establish that chain of trust anymore because it said, you know, I, your their certificate is expired and so I can't trust that this is actually from a trusted certificate anymore. <clears throat> um, so in 1997 also, um, this guy Peter Gutman, who's pretty famous crippy, uh, I believe he's New Zealander, maybe Australian, um, but he reverse engineered the format. So although Authenticode came out and it, it kind of explained, and there was like some documentation to specify how it should be used and everything, the actual file format for it wasn't understood. And so Peter Gutman's paper is very often referenced. Um, and uh, Windows 2000 came out in 2000, and um, it that came with software restriction policies. And so that was really kind of the first, uh, I guess, technology that you could actually use with um, Authenticode. And so what that does, it actually allows you to do application whitelisting. So beginning with Windows 2000, it's still in Windows products. Um, you can implement application whitelisting. It is a pain to use, though, um, and I'll get into why you probably don't actually want to use software restriction policies um, unless you have a very static environment. So maybe you have a point of sales terminal or something like that that you're never touching. Um, and then uh, 2006, uh, Vista 64-bit came out and required drivers to be signed. And that was really the first time when people were like, oh, I actually need to do this. So before it was always like, oh, all the cool kids are doing it, so maybe I should do it, but I don't really have a reason to. And then all of a sudden it was like, oh, if I want my code to run on Vista, I actually have to do this for people that were writing drivers. Um, and so it, it still has not you know, been enforced that everyone has to do this because user land code, um, so your normal code that you're running, uh, doesn't have to be signed. Uh, but th that was kind of the, the first requirement for it. Um, and then in 2008, Microsoft actually documented it, um, so you didn't have to look at Peter Gutman's reverse engineering solution. You could actually see a real specification um, for the file format. Uh, so the best practices for code signing would be that you have an isolated system that's not connected to the Internet, and you compile, you sign there, and then on an Internet-connected system, you do your time stamping. Time stamping has to call out to um, a time stamp server somewhere, um, on the internet, and so that's why that has to be an internet-connected system, and then you deploy it. Um, 
I understand most people aren't going to want to do all their dev work on an isolated box. I have done that before. It is a pain. Um, so most people will end up doing their dev work on a box that is connected to the internet, but you still want to do that code signing on an isolated system. And the reason for that is because your code signing signature is, uh, I mean, that's really establishing the trust that you have. So if your dev box gets compromised, um, at least your code signing signature has not been compromised as well, which is why you'd want to have that on the isolated system. Um, so another thing that a lot of people do is they will just sign it. And so uh, for um, GitHub and Slack's uh, Windows client, so Slack's client actually hasn't come out for Windows yet, uh, but they have a beta product that you can look at. But anyways, um, I don't know if they're actually um, signing it on an isolated system, but they are definitely not time stamping it. Um, and you want to time stamp it. And the reason why is because, in, uh, I'll, I'll show this in a, in a moment, but basically in order to ensure that uh, your file has not been signed with a uh, certificate that has been revoked or has it been expired, um, you have to timestamp it. Uh, so the other thing that people will do, um, and this is probably the most common practice, is just all in the same box. Just compile, sign, timestamp, and deploy it. Um, and the reason you don't want to do that is just because, um, again, your, your signature uh, is something you really don't want to get, or your uh, signing certificate is something you really don't want to get compromised. Um, and then probably the even more common practice is you don't even uh, uh, sign it or timestamp it or anything at all. You just deploy it and no one knows where your uh, files came from. So uh, PuTTY is a very popular application that is not signed. <coughs> uh, so checking that timestamp. So just an explanation of how that's done. So imagine um, if today you got a certificate that was valid for one year and uh, you signed a file. Um, if you have not time stamped it, then after basically the end of the year, after your certificate has expired, um, that file is no longer going to be valid or that certificate um, can no longer be checked properly. Um, so that's why you want to do that time stamping. Um, so if you're a software developer and you figure, all right, I'm, I'm sold, I want to start time stamping. Um, so prices, they can range from free uh, for open source projects. Um, a lot of places you'll see online is about $185 or something like that. Um, VeriSign sells theirs for uh, $795 a year. So if you're the type that buys the gold Apple Watch and has just money to burn, then get VeriSign certificates for that high price. Um, there are some reasons you might want to get their expensive certificates um, because VeriSign was one of the original certificate authorities. Um, they're trusted by much older operating systems. So if you're still targeting like Windows 95 or something like that, then you're going to have to use a VeriSign certificate. Um, and but if you look around hard enough online, you can find um, certificates for uh, $89 per year for just your normal user land certificates, or $165 per year um, for certificates that are capable of signing drivers. So that's where it's kind of the EV or not, um, that extended validation or not. So much like with SSL certificates, if you look at a lot of bank websites, they'll say the name of the bank and then the URL there. Um, and that's because they have an EV certificate. So um, as opposed to just having a picture of the lock up there, they also have a, you know, a green little uh, banner up there and the name of the company. Um, that's what an EV certificate is. And for, for uh, SSL, there's not a whole lot of reason to get that EV certificate other than just makes you look cooler and more trusted and stuff like that. But for code signing, you actually have to get that EV certificate if you want to get a driver um, or if you want to sign drivers. And so those prices there, uh, that $165 a year, that's, that's the, if you get a three year um, certificate, so one that's valid for three years. Um, I think if you get just a one year certificate, it's like $224 or something like that. Um, so that's if you go to sysdev.microsoft.com, which is also the website that you would go to if you wanted to get access to your Windows error reports. Um, you follow some links in there, and then basically it'll bring you to some site. Um, it's going to be DigiCert is where you ultimately want to go in order to pick up uh, that, those cheaper certificates. <clears throat> so now that you have a certificate, how do you actually sign the files? Um, so you can use Microsoft's uh, sign tool. That's going to be the um, way that you'll see online most of the times to sign it. Um, there's also an open source tool called OSSL Sign Code. The reason you'd want to use that is if you want to do your signing from a Linux system or something like that in order to code sign files that are on Windows. Um, there's also a bunch of vendor tools. Um, so I myself actually use DigiCert um, for, for my <laughs> certificate. And so uh, they have like a special tool that I use and, and run that on my isolated system. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm in no way I'm a spokesperson or anything for DigiCert, but they are, I guess, a local company. So if you want to support local, <laughs> I guess um, they're they're Salt Lake City based. 
Um, so how does this all work then? So you have your certificate, you signed a file. Well, what did it actually do when you signed a file? Um, so here on the right, I have uh, a PE header information. Um, and the items that are in grayed out there are the items that are not going to be hashed when you hash that file. So basically when um, you sign a file, it creates a, a hash of that file and then um, and then ends up signing that hash. Um, and so you have to know like what you end, what you're going to be hashing in that file. Um, so you it sign tool or OSSL sign code or any other tools are going to read in your uh, PE file, your executable, um, and then it's going to uh, read everything in the PE header except for the checksum and the certificate table entry. The certificate table entry is basically a pointer um, to where in that file that certificate exists. Um, then it's going to sort and hash the different PE sections um, and then hash anything else that's remaining in there and that's going to be your hash of the file that's uh, used. So certificate table uh, looks very much like just SSL cert data. Um, there's really almost no difference between that information. It is ASN1 encoded. And what that means, um, ASN1 is basically just a binary file format. Um, so if you know XML or JSON, those are text-based file formats. ASN1 is just a binary form file format. So I guess like Google, Google protocol buffers would be something similar to that. Um, and so, so now you're described ASN1 format will say, okay, this byte means that something that follows it is going to be a bit, or it's going to be a string, or it's going to be an integer. Um, and, and so it just lays things out like that. But then you need PKCS number seven in order to describe what is going to be in that file. So it's basically like a schema for XML. It's just going to say, okay, the first thing that's in there is going to be um, the version of the certificate. And the next thing that's in there is going to be the subject name for the certificate, and just kind of describes what each of those things are. Um, so it's all standards-based, um, all that information. It's, uh, there's some, there's a little bit of Microsoft quirkiness to it, but for the most part, um, it's all pretty standard. Uh, and then you want to check that chain of trust. Um, so if you want to validate that a file came from somewhere, uh, first you want to ensure that the signature is valid. So hash the file in the same way, compare the signature that you get with the one that the, is provided by the file, um, ensure the chain of trust is valid. So basically each of the um, certificates are going to be uh, signed one after another up until the certificate authority. Um, ultimately ensure the certificate authority is trusted. So these all chain up to somewhere. So make sure it's not a self-signed certificate that you don't trust. Um, and then uh, you can also include in the certificates uh, what that certificate should be used for. So um, certificates can be used purely for SSL or purely for um, code signing. You, there's not a lot of cases where that's going to be mixed. Um, so because of that, you want to ensure that the code signing certificate that you're looking at is actually for um, code signing and is not an SSL certificate or anything else. Um, so if you actually want to play around and look at some certificate information about your box, uh, if you run uh, certmanager.msc, uh, you'll be able to see information about the root certificates that you have on your system. Um, and you can double click on some of those there and you can see information about what's in that um, certificate. Uh, so in there, uh, you can see at the very bottom that I've highlighted, uh, it's showing the key usage information. Um, unfortunately for certificate authorities, it's not super useful because the certificate authority might specify only certain key usage information, but it can actually use, be used for everything. So it's, it's hard to be able to tell on a system, um, you know, it, given that you have like maybe a hundred certificate authorities or, you know, a couple dozen or something like that, which of these are for SSL, which of these for code signing, you can't really tell, unfortunately. Um, and then there's catalog files is another important thing to understand. So uh, this is something a lot of people run into when they first try and look at uh, files that are code signed. So they'll, they'll take calc.exe and they go to look at the um, who's it signed by just to make sure that they have a good understanding of um, authentic code and, and uh, be able to whitelist. And they look at it and uh, within its properties there's no digital signatures tab. And they're like, what, isn't this signed? Like, didn't this come from Microsoft? Have I been hacked? Is this malware? Like, I don't, I don't understand. Um, and the reason for that is because it's, uh, it is signed, but that signature is actually in a catalog file, which is a separate file. And so Windows, for whatever reason, doesn't check those catalog files um, when it displays the properties uh, view here. Uh, but if you um, use uh, various tools, for example, here I'm using uh, SigCheck, um, which is, uh, it comes with Visual Studio. Um, you can use, or is that... One of the, sorry, that's one of the sysinternals tools, SigCheck is. Um, using SigCheck, it'll actually check the catalog file for you. Um, so that'll help you be able to verify where it is, uh, that it is actually signed, and it'll also show you um, uh, 
sorry. SIGCheck does not show you what catalog it is it's in, but sign, um, sign tool will show you what catalog file it, it's in. Um, so looking at that file, you can then look at <coughs> uh, where the catalog file is. Um, and so here in, Winter, uh, in, in, sorry, in Windows Explorer, um, I'm looking at all the different catalog files that I have on my system. Um, and I can see there I have, I think that says 3,000 different uh, catalog files that exist there. Um, so then looking at one of those catalog files, so this is a catalog file that was used for calc.exe, um, I can see that there are uh, almost 5,000 different files that have a signature in there, so those are what those different tag entries are, and so those thumbprints are basically uh, the SHA-256 hash of those files there. And so if you trust that, um, <coughs> that catalog file, then you should trust that file. Um, so what I've looked at here is, uh, if you go to, uh, I don't know how to pronounce it, L-A-P-O dot I-T, um, you go to that site, uh, it's just a web app up there that you can drag and drop a catalog file to or any type of certificate to, and it'll actually do the ASN1 parsing there. So you can see on the left um, some of the information that's included in the parse, so it, it should show you there's some sequences, there's going to be some integers, there's going to be like an object ID, object ID is specifying what information is going to come next in that next object within the sequence. Um, and then there on the right, you just have a hex dump of that information. And this is a pretty cool web app tool to just be able to understand the ASN1 format better. Um, so revocation. So if you do lose your certificate or it gets, um, I, I guess if your system gets hacked or something like that and you haven't put it on an isolated system, you're going to have to do certificate rev revocation in the same way that with SSL certificates and things like Heartbleed and stuff, you had to do some uh, revoking there. Um, so again, it's very similar uh, concept. Um, and so within the certificates, there's going to be a, a link to a CRL file that's going to be a, basically a CAB file. Um, so same format that we sh saw before, except instead of um, the CAB file containing certificates that you should trust, it's containing um, a list of hashes of certificates that you should not trust. Um, and so just to give you an understanding of um, some of those things, uh, it's updated about twice per month. Um, and each of those uh, certificate authorities in those CRL files, um, they end up revoking about a thousand um, certificates per year, um, and they rarely give a reason. So with SSL certificates, you can give a reason like it's been compromised or um, you know I lost it or something like that, uh, but they they never give any reasons for it. Uh, so just miscellaneous information um, for you here, uh, Adobe they sell uh, they there's products, uh, for example, Adobe Reader, um, they, they sign it with a different certificate per product um, and per version. So, for example, um, Adobe Reader number version 11 is actually signed with a certificate that's specific to Adobe Reader version um, 11. So they had a different certificate for Adobe Reader version 10. Um, and if they are going to uh, sign a different product, they have a different certificate. So that's just kind of an interesting use case. That's, that's kind of rare. Most of the times people just use the same certificate for all of the products at their company. Um, and from what I saw, I looked kind of in the history of things, and Adobe Reader version 5 uh, was first signed back in 2001. Um, so just to give you guys an understanding that a lot of files are signed today. Um, <coughs> so If you are a developer and you're developing different products, um, you may want to run into the awkward situation in which you want to modify a file after you have code signed it, which is exactly what you should not be capable of doing. Um, and so the reason that you would want to do this is uh, Dropbox and GoToMeeting do this technique, um, which is uh, you log into Dropbox, for example, and you know you typed in your credentials in there, and then you download the installer and uh, most of the times what should happen is you download the installer, you run that installer, and then you have to retype in your credentials in order to be able to authenticate your system uh, again. Uh, what Dropbox has done, though, in GoToMeeting, is they have actually included in that installer you downloaded um, some of your authentication information so that you can um, just download the installer, run it, and you're already authenticated. No need to retype in any of your information. Um, so that's kind of a nice little usability benefit there. Um, <clears throat> for myself, I needed to use it because uh, my product basically um, an administrator is going to want to download it and then run it across all of their systems, and, they, and you want all the systems to be authenticated up to a cloud server, and you don't want to have to retype in, you know, your credentials into all of your potentially, you know, thousands of systems that you've installed my product on. Um, and so, <clears throat> the way that they accomplish this 
is if we look on the left here is, uh, I believe this was like the Adobe Reader installer, and then on the right here, um, I believe was the Dropbox installer. Um, and so here I have highlighted uh, in the unauthenticated attributes uh, section there, which is the authentication information for the Dropbox um, server. And so what's in there also is the counter signing signature, which is the, which is the time stamping signature. Um, so if you remember, I, I, sorry, go back to this. Um, you remember I talked about previously, you want to sign on one box and then timestamp on another box. And so if you already time, if you already sign the file and then you timestamp it, timestamping is going to be modifying that file in some way. And so that's what it's doing is it's adding information to that unauthenticated attributes there. And so that's the trick is adding information to the authenticated attributes um, in order to add in whatever additional configuration information you want to add to your file. Um, so <clears throat> this, there were some other tricks that you could do. Um, you could add information to the very end of the certificate table there, uh, but someone was doing something dumb. Um, I believe it was Google that was doing this for their uh, Chrome um, installer. And what they were doing is basically they just give you a bootstrap installer that's only you know a few K or something like that, a few hundred K, and then that will get and go ahead and download an uh, external installer of you know, a few megs in order to install the remainder of the application. Um, unfortunately, what they were doing is in that authentic on um, in the end of that certificate table there, they just slapped in a URL. And so basically you download your Chrome installer or bootstrapper. Um, and so again, I believe this was Chrome. I apologize if it was not dumb, but that's uh, my understanding of the situation. Um, you download this bootstrap installer and you know you verify its integrity. It says you know that it's from Google, and then uh, and then it would download this additional installer when you went and ran it. Um, unfortunately, uh, someone figured this out that that was what was happening, so that they changed that URL that it was downloading to be you know bad.exe from evil.com. And so you download your Chrome installer and check it, and it looks fine and everything. And then uh, you run it, and it downloads bad.exe instead and runs that. And so that broke the whole concept of being able to verify the integrity of the files. Um, so Microsoft decided to you know, give them a slap on the wrist and not allow this anymore. They still do allow the other trick. Um, so Eventually, someone's probably going to do something dumb, and Microsoft's going to block that from happening as well. Uh, but for now, it's possible. Um, <clears throat> so if you do decide to do this trick, uh, be very careful what you put in that area. Do not just put a URL in there to download. Um, if you, you should probably, in some way, verify the integrity of the data that, that is in there. So you might want to you know, code sign or do some other type of signature check on the data that you put in there with you know, a different certificate. Um, some type of quirky thing, or just don't put anything too valuable in there. Um, so in order to help you guys make that, be able to accomplish that, um, and because I had to do it myself, uh, so I modified OSSL uh, sign code and uh, added in capabilities in order to do that. So um, that's the GitHub account for Summit Route. You can download that fork there. It is in the official branch as well um, of OSSL sign code now, but um, they haven't uh, made an actual release of it yet, so I have some binaries that you can uh, run if you want to, and they are code signed by Summit Route and everything, so you should be able to trust their integrity. Um, <clears throat> so if you actually want to use Authenticode in order to verify the integrities of files, um, you'll ultimately do something called application whitelisting. And so uh, application whitelisting is an old concept, but it's just not used as often. So application blacklisting is what antivirus does uh, primarily. Um, so they also include some application whitelisting as well. But primarily antivirus, the concept behind it is you have a whole bunch of uh, patterns that you want to look for in a file or hashes of files that you don't trust. And so you say, these are all the known bads. Don't allow any of these to run. Um, application whitelisting is the opposite of that. It says, these are all the known goods. Don't allow anything that's not on my list to run. <coughs> so. If you want to do this, you can use uh, software restriction policies. Um, so these have been around since Windows 2000, so it's been around forever. You have it on your system now, probably. Uh, but the problem is it's very hard to manage. There's no ability to import or export. You have to use their UI for things. Um, there's no audit mode, so you can't say, you know, here's a list of rules I want to use. Generate an alert if I ever run anything that doesn't... Uh, use these rules. And so the problem with that is, uh, if you don't have that audit mode, that means you either turn all of your uh, application whitelisting on, or it's off completely. Um, so what that means is, if you generate an application whitelisting policy that has a list of trusted files, and you forgot an important file in there, and then you try and run it, it's going to block it from running. So 
uh, people can potentially end up bricking their boxes uh, by not including the right files there. Um, and then NSA, uh, they advocate using application whitelisting. Um, the Australian uh, DSD, I believe it is, which is their version of the NSA, they have like a, a list of top 20 things that you should do to secure your environments, and number one on there is to do application whitelisting. It is like a very uh, easy way to remove a lot of threats that exist out there. Um, and so the NSA has just a document describing how to use software restriction policies. Um, so software restriction policies is kind of a pain to use. So uh, there's also built into Windows a thing called AppLocker. Um, unfortunately, it's only built into the enterprise and server versions of uh, recent versions of Windows. Um, so and, and again, it suffers from some of the some similar usability issues. So a lot of people don't end up using it because again, it is kind of painful to use, um, or they just they don't set very strong rules in there. So, you know, maybe they, they um, you know, whitelist a path as opposed to whitelisting um, a, a, a certain uh, certificate. <coughs> uh, there are some open source tools that you can also use, um, but these just scan your systems periodically. So Tripwire and SysCheck from um, OSSEC, uh, what these will do is basically you can have a, um, some type of a job that every night it'll just scan through all of your files, do hashes of all of them, and then ensure that no new files exist or nothing was changed or something like that. Um, so it's not it's not really protection as so much it is just a detection to see if uh, you had been hacked at some point during the day or during the week or whenever you um, schedule that job for. Um, so if you do want to do application whitelisting, uh, how much pain is involved in this? So this is just a sample system. Uh, this is one of my dev boxes, actually. Um, so uh, looking for any files that have a PE header on it, so just anything with, that starts with MZ at the very beginning of it, um, I had about 23 or 24,000 different files on my system. Um, and of those, only 8% were not signed. Um, and a lot of those existed within um, C Windows Assembly and uh, C Windows SSX, which is basically used for .NET, where it is automatically generating um, some files in there. And uh, so those were not code signed. Um, additionally, uh, SIGWIN is not code signed. So if you ha are using various Git clients on Windows, uh, chances are they're using different SIGWIN files um, or just other open source files that aren't going to be signed on there. Um, and so. <clears throat> on my system, uh, there were eight different Microsoft certificates, and these accounted for 89% of the files um, on my system, and there were about 36 certs total. So I would just have to have rules set up for 36 certificates, and then a couple other rules in there, um, or a few hundred rules for uh, different hashes that I want to trust as well. And that would be able to lock down my system so that nothing new could run on my system. Um, so why would you want to do application whitelisting? What are the different threats that it's going to be stopping there? Um, so kind of the most obvious threat is just if you're tricking the user into downloading and running something, um, it's going to block that. Additionally, DLL hijacking, um, or if you plug a USB into a computer and it tries to use auto runs tricks or uh, Stuxnet's dot link vulnerability, um, if any of those uh, victims had have used uh, application whitelisting, they would have not have been, um, I guess, exploited or compromised. Um, and then uh, a lot of malware campaigns are blocked. Um, so application whitelisting is not directly trying to defeat um, things that are going to be using uh, uh, memory corruption exploits, uh, so different buffer overflows, or things of that nature where you're getting code to execute in memory, because once you can execute in memory, chances are you may be able to you know, stop one of these application whitelisting solutions from running. Um, so this is really just trying to stop legitimate ways that Microsoft runs tools uh, or runs processes from being able to run. Um, and then additionally, it'll help stop different man-in-the-middle attacks. So uh, if you download PuTTY, you're downloading it over HTTP. It is not signed. You have no way to verify the integrity of that file um, other than checking it on virus total or you know, trying to verify this is no one hash of the file or something like that. Um, then additionally, a lot of auto updates, um, they just occur over HTTP as well. Uh, so that's it. Um, so I'm a pretty fast talker. There's a bunch coming up and everything. Uh, but if you guys have any questions, uh, feel free to ask. Or if there's a few moments of awkward silence, then just start clapping. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, 
Um, yeah, so, so this is a way of verifying the integrity of all those files. Um, if this is application that you wrote, um, most of the times people would just end up signing the initial installer. Um, and so then anything that's contained within that installer um, should also be trusted. Uh, the best course of action is to sign all of those files, but, but that's usually what most people end up doing. And then as far as, you know, if you if you've installed it somewhere and then you want to verify that those files haven't been changed or something like that, I mean, you could use this, but this is probably overkill for that. Um, I'm not sure what a better solution would be. Uh, I have run into situations where users have done weird things like that, where you know they, they decide they're smarter than the developers and they figure they'll just replace a DLL or something like that, and you're just like, how? This, that's a horrible idea, but um, yeah, I'm not sure if, if this would be the best solution for that, really. Um, I would say there, there are some of those um, open source certificates out there, so um, you, could, you could try and start just signing things with those. Um, the easiest way, though, is just generate your own self-signed certificate, and then you can add that self-signed certificate as a certificate authority on your own system, on your own test box, and uh, just play around with things like that. That's going to be your, your easiest way. Using the open source certificates will allow you to share whatever executables you've generated with a friend, and it'll be able to work on their system, and they'll be able to verify the integrity. Um, but for the most part, everyone just uses self-signed certificates. That's what I use in testing myself as, um, also, is I just generate a self-signed certificate, have that certificate authority, trust it all in my test boxes, and then uh, deploy to those systems. And then once I wanted to really um, actually deploy my code, uh, then I'd go ahead and do the painful process of transferring it to an isolated system and code signing it and everything like that. But just for testing and development purposes, it's obviously a lot faster to do everything on your own system there. Any other questions? All right, thank you.